All right. Thank you very much, Stephanos. I appreciate the introduction and the, uh, the invitation. Uh, I'll start off by saying I was going to project from my Windows tablet, but it was so light they thought it might blow away, and so they wanted me to do the clunky old Mac. So I'm going to be projecting this from a Mac, and I apologize if you know it's a little slow to transition slides or, or anything like that. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about a project that we've been running at Microsoft Research for the past four years, and we were uh, fortunate to be able to talk about publicly starting this year. And I'll, I'll start the talk by... Uh, doing a little bit of discussions about what we see coming next and what we think think the, the disruptive transitions that are soon arriving are going to be. And I really think we're starting to move from an era of multi-core into, like Stefano said, one of specialization. And I'll talk about exactly what that means. So if you look at the history of computing, I like to look back before we look forward. You know, for the first several thousand years of computing, we really did analog specialization. We built devices that, you know, were, were, were approximate things that you saw in the real world and, and really use analog techniques. We didn't have programmable digital computers. But with the start of the digital revolution, you know, the publication of uncomputable numbers by Turing in 1936, uh, von Neumann, you know, uh, Church, all that really, really important seminal work that happened in the, in the 1930s and early 40s, uh, we really started moving towards digital computing, programmable computing, deterministic computing, the ability to, to reuse programs. And there was just a huge spate of invention that happened over that next 30 years. And, and most of the techniques that we rely on today were invented in that time. And we've been kind of mixing and mashing them up since then. You know, parallel processing, caches, virtual memory, all that good stuff. Uh, and then a as uh, VLSI integration really took off, we, we saw an era of integration. And we were pulling in all those, all those uh, techniques into smaller and smaller form factors, eventually pulling them onto one chip and getting the cost benefits and the performance benefits from integration. I mean, risk really took off in the early days, not because it was faster, but because it, was, it had much less control logic and you could fit a whole processor on a single chip earlier than you could for the CISC architectures. And then at, at some point, we, you know, we have all the processors and maybe even the, the floating point coprocessors integrated. And as I think many of you know, and we all know, the, the industry really went on this rapid escalation of single thread performance, pushing on clock rates and then instruction level parallelism. And people used to talk about the killer micro, you know, these, this exponential growth in performance that was just wiping out supercomputer companies left and right because they just couldn't keep up with that rapid pace of invention. And then like Stefano said, that all came to if not a screeching halt, a precipitous slowdown uh, around 2004, 2005. And we, and we made the, the transition to multi-core. And that's been a really great run. I mean, we've, we've you know, multi-cores are now ubiquitous. If you can program parallel programs effectively, you get a great speed up. Uh, you get really efficient execution. We have lots of uh, specialized, many core parts sitting for, for uh, dedicated functions, you know, network processing, things like this. Uh, graphics certainly in the industry. Uh, but what's happened is these power limits have really started to put a cap on the utility you get from many more cores. So for the mainstream general purpose direction as opposed to specialized coprocessors, you know, I don't think we're going to see chips with a thousand high-end cores or even a few hundred high-end cores. You know, the power is just fundamentally limiting us. So we are going to have many cores, you know, forever. They're not going away. We're not going to roll back. But many more cores as the primary driver of performance, I think, is coming to an end. And I don't know whether it's next year or this year or two or three years from now. Um, but we're, we're really in starting to be in the middle uh, or the beginning of a transition. And all of this, of course, was driven by Moore's Law, you know, plus Denard scaling. And now we're, we're really more on Moore's Law. So we're getting more transistors. They just may not be getting faster or more efficient. Okay, so what comes next? Well, we've taken a big bet on hardware specialization, particularly in the data center. And this is really designing hardware that's much more tuned at specific functions or workloads. And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the approach that we're taking to try to exploit this. And it's a very, very different model. Uh, it's disruptive. It's, it's a different paradigm than, than writing software to run on multiple core, single core or multiple cores. Okay, so Moore's Law. Uh, which has been driving a lot of this, is really in its last stages. And there's, there's certainly a tremendous debate in the community about when it will end, uh, but the end is pretty soon. And people have different opinions on this. Um, 
but we don't know when the end will be. It could be next year, it could be three years, it could be four years, but we're very, very close. Uh, we're starting to hit not only power limits, but cost limits. And it's really economics that I think is going to drive the end of, of silicon scaling. You know, I think physically we will be able to manufacture smaller transistors, but it will be very expensive to do so. And the gains we will get won't be worth the cost. And so when that happens, you know, we won't know until we're well into it. You know, the roadmap will look fine. People will, tell, people will be telling us, yes, that next node is coming. And then we'll get there and it will seem it will be too expensive and the economics won't work. And at that point, uh, some really exciting times happen. So I just, I have a graph here from a, a, a strategy report uh, that was published a year ago. And on the, the y-axis there, we have uh, cost per transistor. I'm sorry, the labels are too small to read. On the x-axis, we have process node a year. And what we've seen, uh, you know, for, for, for decades, four or five decades, the cost of integrated circuits, you know, per transistor or per device has been dropping exponentially. And what we've started to see is a flattening out of those cost reductions. I think, you know, Intel is still looking like they're going to push them down. But even for, for those processes, the cost gains are slowing. And so when they really stop, uh, that's when things get really interesting. You want two times the number of transistors on that next device, it'll cost you two times as much. And that breaks the economics of the industry. So, so when that comes and we think it's pretty soon, it's going to be very, very disruptive. And then, of course, at that point, you know, you don't get more transistors per device for each generation. So you have to start doing something different with the existing transistors. And so the, the bet that we're taking is specialization, at least in the cloud. Okay, so this is a well-known graph uh, that Bob Broderson put together in the early 2000s. And he took a, a, a number of processors and chips that were published in ISSCC, one of the top uh, processor chip conferences. And on the x-axis here, just each point represents a different chip published over two years in that conference. And this was, you know, a decade and a half ago, but the results still hold. And on the y-axis is the efficiency of the operations on that chip. So how many joules does it do to take in, to do an add or do an instruction? And what you see, and this is a log scale on the y-axis, what you see is that over here on the left, you have the general purpose processors, which are not very efficient. And we all know this, okay? You know, the, the service he did was really quantifying it. And then the middle DSPs, and they might be 10, 20, 30 times more efficient than a high-end general purpose processor. You know, they're tailored for a specific set of workloads. They have dedicated instructions for signal processing. And then all the way on the right, you have ASICs. And these are 100 to 1,000 times more efficient than a high-end general purpose processor. So there's three to four orders of magnitude of potential efficiency that can be harvested as you specialize your hardware to fewer and fewer functions. Now, of course, that sounds great to get that efficiency, but we benefit from our chips being programmable, right? You know, ASICs take a long time to design. They hu require huge amounts of verification. They've become very expensive. And so you can't do this for everything. One of the really nice things, though, is that we, we have uh, this class of chips called FPGAs, which are programmable logic, where you can change the logic on the chip on the fly. And so you can have multiple hardware designs targeting the same chip, and you just switch them out over time. You pay a price in efficiency compared to an ASIC. You know, you're maybe 10x less efficient than an ASIC. You know, you, the clock is much slower. The efficiency is lower. But you're still potentially one to two orders of magnitude more efficient than running in software. So I'll, I'll talk more about those in, in a moment. So if I look at the, the spectrum from fully general on the left to extremely specialized and, and and dedicated and not programmable on the right. You have you know, high-end single-thread performance CPUs on the left. You have ASICs on the right. But there's a l and there's you know, three orders of magnitude difference, but there are many points in that spectrum. Okay, you can have you know, chip multiprocessors or multi-core designs that have you know, a, a, a larger number of processors. They might be a little bit slower. You might clock them a little bit less slow to deal with the power on the chip. Then you go to many core designs where they're much simpler cores, but you can afford many of them. And you're getting more and more specialized in the sense that you can run fewer and fewer uh, classes of workloads as you move from the left to the right. General, you know, GP, GPUs, they need a, you need lots of threads. You know, you have this, this warp threading model, you need SIMD parallelism. You can go then to ALU arrays where you have lots of ALUs, you know, or adders and multipliers, you know, connected with different, different uh, wiring networks and then ASICs on the right. So there's a big spectrum here. Now, if we think about you know, the cloud and the client, which are sort of the two extremes. You know, David uh, will, I'm sure, will be 
knows a lot more about the, uh, the client side than I do, so I'll leave it to him to discuss that stuff. I'll talk about the cloud. Uh, he may know more about the cloud than I do too. Um, but in, in the cloud, there are really two main challenges for doing the specialization. The first is that we want as many of our servers as possible to be the same. Okay, you're running a very large infra large scale infrastructure. Uh, I don't want 50 types of servers in that infrastructure because I have to maintain them, I have to keep spares, I have to you know, adapt the software to them. So I want the infrastructure to look very uniform. So that of course works against specialization. Uh, and then the second problem we have is that you need the software to be very stable for a long time. You know, if it takes me two years to design an ASIC, and that's actually pretty aggressive, and get it into the servers, and the server's going to be in use for three years, that, that means whatever function I'm specializing, I need that function to be used and stable for five years. Okay, and that's a long time in this industry. So, so I'll focus on the cloud in this talk, and I'll, I'll leave the client. And then, and then the other challenge, of course, is that we just have this enormous scale. So I just, you know, since I'm from Microsoft, I have, you know, the Microsoft example and the other large cloud companies, Google, Amazon, and others, uh, you know, operate at, at large scale also and have lots of services. But if you look at, at just Microsoft as an example, and you look at our data center infrastructure, we have well over 200 large first party services that we run, meaning that there's services like Bing, um, you know, machine learning service, Office. These are things that our own software that we run in our data center. So that's at least 200 of those. And, and we have, you know, then the cloud, uh, Azure, which we're, we let other customers come in and run code. And we currently have over 20 million businesses running code in Azure, okay? So the, the number of workloads is enormous, even if you just consider our, our own workloads. And then if you look at all the people running code, you know, it's just a massive number. So how do you specialize for that at that scale? And the answer is, of course, it's very hard. There's just such a large code base. There are so many different algorithms running, and they change very rapidly. And of course, you've got a massive number of users, you know, billions of users for some services, hundreds of millions for others. So you, so changing it is is hard. You have to get it right. You can't have a service that that blocks those users. And of course, you're running a large distributed infrastructure, you know, with data centers popping up everywhere uh, and growing very rapidly. And so we're running well over a million servers across the data centers, and we're constructing new ones all the time. And so that, at that scale, uh, anything you do, you want it to, to be applied everywhere. Uh, because if you start putting some special function in your Australian data center, then the, the software that benefits can only run there. And there may be you know, national laws that mean that you need, you need to run somewhere else. You might want to migrate services on a failure. So you really want your infrastructure to look as similar as possible, you know, all, all over the world. And then the other challenge, of course, when you're doing this, is that the growth rate is incredibly high. You know, so the cloud has been exploding in popularity. And so if you just take, again, take the Microsoft example, if you just look four years ago, you know, we were running about 100,000 virtual machines to service customers. Now we're running millions. Uh, you know, we had tens of petabytes in our, of storage. Now we have exabytes. And the algorithms to manage these are constantly changing. And then, you know, in the network, tens of terabits per second, and it's now petabits per second. So, so again, it's very fast moving, it's growing rapidly, and, and so just specialization in this context sounds incredibly hard. Okay, so just to summarize what the data center env environment looks like, and I'd like you to keep that in your mind as, as we talk about the architecture that we've built to do specialization in the data center, your software services are changing rapidly, uh, your machines are gonna last about three years, and, but you purchase them on a rolling basis. So every quarter, you, you purchase a new set and you retire a set. And then, of course, you know, re frequently you're rolling over your machines to new services. So some services get the, the best new machines. Other services get the older, slower machines with less storage. And so you've got this waterfall effect of services rolling down to machines. Okay, so they get repurposed you know, a third or halfway into their life cycle. And you can't afford to maintain them very much in hardware. So if a machine breaks, it might be weeks before you pull it out and repair it. You really want that infrastructure to stay up and stay automated. So for all these reasons, the, you know, the homogeneity, all of the servers being as similar as possible is highly desirable. Okay, so we want specialization and homogeneity and that's kind of an oxymoron. Okay, one more slide on the, on the constraints we face. So if you think about specialization and uh, efficiency, you know, they, 
you, you specialize, but you lose generality. So I can think of CPUs as being very general and ASICs as being the most efficient. And of course, the thing that sits in the middle of those, those two are programmable accelerators, multi-core designs, many core designs, GPUs, FPGAs, all these sorts of things. But of course, we have this third challenge, which is we want, you know, we want uh, accel our accelerators to be the same across all of these servers running all of these services. And so the bet that we took was to use FPGAs, to actually use programmable logic rather than an accelerator like a GPU. Uh, not to say that the GPUs or other types of accelerators wouldn't work, uh, but this is the approach that we took. That's what seemed to make the most sense given these three, these three constraints that work against one another. And then just again, so to emphasize the, the challenges we face, I have a graph here that on the x-axis shows time and years, and on the y-axis shows the percent of servers on which something is running. So if you want to build some specialized unit like an ASIC, uh, you really want your servers, you want that workload to be stable over five years, you know, so you have time to design the ASIC and then you put it in and it's useful for the life of the server. And you would like that ASIC to be useful for all of the servers, 100% of the servers. You know, if only half of the workloads running can use the ASIC and I want that ASIC to be in all the servers because I want the servers to be homogenous, then I've actually wasted half of the money I've spent on that ASIC if only half the servers are using it. Okay, so the farther down you go on the y-axis, you know, the more money you're wasting by putting stuff in that a lot of the servers don't need. And so what do our services actually look like? What does the real data center look like on this graph? It's here. Okay, so the largest single workload we have running is on about 2% of our servers. That's the largest one because there's hundreds of properties and millions of businesses running. And the software changes every month. So, you know, changing monthly, by the time you get to that, the end of that five years that you want to design an ASIC, your software has changed 60 times, okay, on 2% of your servers. So, so this specialization challenge is really tough in the data center for these reasons, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's not well aligned. So now, Bing was the, the, the killer app uh, that my group decided to try to accelerate as a first step towards doing the specialization, and I'll talk more about what we built and, and what the application looks like momentarily. Um, but again, to show that spectrum again from you know, flexibility uh, of the CPU, you know, in this case we use Xeons all the way to the ASICs and you know, the network interface cards have uh, network you know, processor ASICs on them, so we're using ASICs there. Okay. So you can think if I built some specialized system to accelerate search, internet search with Bing, I could use an FPGA, that's kind of in the middle of that spectrum. You know, you have to write in a different language. It's not fully flexible like a CPU, but it's, you can change it. It's not locked down like an ASIC. Or I could build a search ASIC, which is great. But then your, your software changes. You know, the next month it changes. And so in, with an FPGA, you could actually change the code on it and have a new version of the accelerator, pr provided that you can design fast enough to keep up with the rate of change of software. Uh, the ASIC, Either you're, you've got it sitting in there and you can't use it anymore, so you're wa you've wasted money and, and you're wasting power, or, yep. It's cheap to use it if you can use it. But if your software changes and it's no longer applicable, then you can't use it. Or, you know, you, it holds back your software. You paid for this ASIC, you want to keep using it, You'd prefer to use different algorithms, but now you can't. Okay, so those are your choices. So yes, it's cheap if you can use it, but it, all can, it also can hold back software. And then of course, you know, it's sitting in the server. We don't want to service the server. We don't want to change its hardware configuration because we're running at such large scale. So now you reassign the server a year later to some other workload, let's say, you know, some high performance computing cluster. And now that ASIC is completely useless because it's optimized for search. Yes. Is that better? Okay. So I think the question was, what if the ASIC is $5? Okay. At a million servers, it's $5 million. Maybe that's not a huge amount of money. Um, but, you know, these high-end ASICs that I want to design, they have large NREs, and I don't, want to, uh, I don't want to waste any money. And there's a good chance, you know, some of these ASICs are expensive. So certainly, if there's a function that meets the criteria I had on the other slide, which all of the servers can use and it'll be stable, We'll put that in an ASIC and we'll put those in the servers. Okay, so I'm not arguing against ASICs. I'm arguing that the ASICs don't work in all cases. 
Okay, so if you think about our design requirements when we set out on this project, we, we want to specialize our hardware uh, with an FPGA fabric that I'll describe on the next couple slides, and we want to keep the servers homogenous. We want them to all look the same. It can't cost too much. So I have a, this isn't a tight bound, it's a loose bound, but I don't want it to cost more than 30% the cost of the server for this hardware. Okay, and I need to provide a positive return on investment. So I need to provide, if my target is 30%, I need to provide more gain than 30% in cost. I can't burn too much power. Okay, the server designs, you know, they've got a power delivery system that's only going to produce so much power. You have contracts with the utilities, you're only going to get so much power from the utilities. So we, you know, when we were talking to the product groups, we said we're going to have to cap the power, we draw at 10% of power. So let's say 25 watts maximum for this accelerator. And then of course, we don't want to break anything. So it has to work in our existing servers, it has to work in our existing server infrastructure, it can't cause the hardware to fail at a faster rate. Uh, and we can't modify the network. Okay, so you, we've got to work with what you've got. It can't cost too much. It can't burn too much power, and you have to provide big gains across you know, a wide variety of services. So the first thing we did in 2011 is said, well, okay, we're going to take a bet on FPGAs. We're going to try to make them work in the data center for the cloud. And so we, we took a look at the Bing algorithm, which I'll describe shortly, and we said, all right, we can't fit it all in one FPGA, so we need a bunch of them. So we designed this board, the picture you see up there, and we put six Xilinx LX240T FPGAs on the board, wired them together with a mesh network. There's a PCIe switch there in the middle to talk to the host, and so you can talk to each of the FPGAs through PCI as well. And we said, okay, this, this looks great. And we ported the Bing backend, the ranking engine, to this board, took it to the product group and said, okay, here it is. You know, we're from research, we're here to help. Here you go. And they said, no, we don't want it. And of course, we said, but this is what you asked for a year ago. But uh, they said, we don't want it. And, and the reason is, to, to use this board in the data center, you need a specialized server. Okay, so we were looking at super micro 2U servers where you could fit a bunch of these PCIe cards. There's room in the server for it. And, and then you'd, you know, we'd put one or more of those boards in, put that server into the rack, and then use that as an offload engine. Um, but that didn't work, and it didn't work really for the following three reasons. And when I say didn't work, I mean they didn't want it. It broke their model. So first of all, all of the servers to use that board would have to communicate with, you know, through the network, through the Ethernet network within a rack with that one special box there. And so you've got 48 servers all driving documents to be ranked into one box, and that crushes the network. Okay, so they said no for that. Uh, now you've broken homogeneity. So now you have the second type of server, which is in your rack, and you have to design it. You've got to keep up with it. You've got to you maintain parts for it. It just breaks that supply chain uniformity. It breaks that homogeneity. And they said, that's bad. We don't want that. Um, and then I think the worst thing is it's got very limited elasticity. What if you need more than six FPGAs on a board? Well, you can't use it. You know, you're limited to six. What if you need fewer than six? Well, you're kind of stuck. You've paid for six. So you, you really, it, it, it locks you into a certain number of FPGAs. As, as it turned out, we needed a lot more than six. We grew, the application grew very rapidly, and if we had gone with that model, we would have been in problem, uh, would, would have been in trouble. And then finally, you're also paying for that extra server, it's additional cost. So we went and redesigned the system, and, and that led us to uh, what we've actually, we're, what we're actually now building, which is a, a distributed fabric of directly connected FPGAs. So on the bottom there, I've shown you a, an array of CPUs, okay, you know, sitting in servers. So these are at several boxes, and then we, we put an FPGA in every server, and, uh, and they communicate through PCIe. Okay, so that's pretty standard. People do stuff like that all the time. The problem is now, if I have an application that needs to use four FPGAs, and I just do it like this, like say a web search pipeline, what I have to do is the CPU can communicate with its local FPGA, then it has to go through the switch to the next CPU, in and out, in and out, in and out, very inefficient, too slow, uh, doesn't work well. So instead what we did is said, let's build a fabric of FPGAs by wiring them all directly together. In, I mean, I show a mesh here, but what we, what we actually use is a torus, a six by eight torus. And so now the FPGAs can communicate directly with one another, uh, independent of the CPUs. And so this is, this is what we call an elastic fabric because you can change the number of FPGAs you use for a service by spatially allocating some number of FPGAs on that fabric. 
and they can communicate with each other with very low latency, you know, 400 nanoseconds. And so you can build a pipeline this way. You know, a CPU that wants to rank a document will send the document over PCIe, it will flow down the pipeline, the answer will flow back, and it will return the answer to its local server. And then, of course, on that fabric, you can roll out other services. So really what we're, what we're uh, doing is building a second computational plane within the data center. Yes? It's an uh, open interface, so any core can access any FPGA. So the way, we've, the way we've architected the system, the FPGAs are sitting in I.O. space, mm -hmm. and so any core can go through an, a, a driver and communicate with an FPGA. And we actually, ha I, I, don't, I won't talk about this in the talk in detail, but we have a DMA interface where there are many slots, and so different processes or different cores can just allocate different slots in that DMA interface. So you can have 64 threads all injecting requests onto the FPGA at once. Mm -hmm. Dynamically, yeah. And, and also the interface between the FPGA, this is dedicated and it's a specialized, uh, so to say. So the FPGA code knows which one should be used to communicate with FPGA and which one should be used to communicate with the core. Well, on the FPGA side, you can put whatever you want on there. Yeah. So we've built logic like what you've described. Okay. Okay. But it's, it's up to you. I mean, it's up yeah. to the, the, the FPGA designer. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So if you, if you t take a step back and abstract this, we can think of the green plane here as being the programmable software plane where each square is a, is a CPU. And of course, they're connected you know, to, to top of rack switches through those vertical lines. And then there's higher level switches. You know, The CS stands for cluster switch. So you have this networking fabric in the data center. And then sitting below that is this programmable hardware plane where each server can, can go over PCIe down to its, its local element on that programmable plane. But there's a secondary network connecting, you know, shown by the little bumps there, connecting elements on that programmable plane. So it's really two separate planes with two different programming paradigms, two different networks, uh, but that you can call on down onto that plane, you can lay services out on it and call down onto it to accelerate workloads and to do specialized cloud services. Okay, so now I'll, so that's the model that we've been pushing forward. And now what I'll do is describe a little bit about the, ser the specifics of the hardware. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here is a picture of, of the server that we released. So this is the first server that Microsoft designed in-house. And we released it to Open Compute, the Open Compute Initiative. So the designs are, are available through that initiative. And uh, it's a half U server, so it's one U high and very long and narrow. So in a rack, we put two of them together in parallel. You just slide them in. And the air flows from left to right. So you can see the disks there in front and then the CPUs and DRAM there in the middle. And so all the hot air is blowing out the right-hand side. And this is the place where we had space for doing an accelerator card. Okay, so the card we designed to be compatible with our server infrastructure had to fit in that space. And I actually brought a card here. Uh, you know, it's small enough to fit in my jacket pocket. It's not very comfortable. And I wouldn't take it through airport security. But it, uh, it's small, and you're welcome to come up and look at it after the talk. It's a 16-layer board. It's got an FPGA with a heat sink, two uh, SODIMs of DRAM, 8 gig of DRAM total, 16 layers on the board. There's a lot of routing because there's a lot of input output but it actually fits down on the motherboard in that little space. And I think I've already, already talked about this. And so for the fabric to interconnect the boards to create this hardware fabric, we actually have cables that run out the back of the server. And so this, this uh, mezzanine connector here has both the PCIe coming out, but also the extra pins for the Taurus network. And this plugs into the motherboard. This, the, the traces route to the back of the motherboard and out to some connectors. And then we can just wire up you know, the, in the back of the server, create, you know, we use SAS cables to connect them to other FPGAs. So really, you know, while you're going through a bunch of connectors and a cable, the FPGA really talks directly to other FPGAs and it doesn't go through the host or software or CPUs or anything. Now on the back of the server, of course, there's this big gnarly mess of uh, six by eight Taurus, but uh, that's, that's okay. Uh, it's just kind of a pain to cable. And so you, you go, you, each FPGA has a north, south, east, west neighbor and we construct the Taurus that way. So if we drop down a level and think about what actually goes on this FPGA to offload these specialized workloads, uh, and this is not a new concept, this is our version of the concept, we created something called the shell, 
which is that, uh, you know, the colored blocks around the periphery of the FPGA. And in some sense, this is our, our operating system, our hardware operating system. It has all of the logic for permissions. It has all of the, uh, the I.O. units, you know, the units to talk to the local DRAM, PCIe, the units to talk to the network, um, you know, the, the logic to do reconfiguration, logic to scrub for soft errors in the, in the, in the uh, configuration logic and a bunch of other things like temperature sensors and, and LEDs. And then in the core is where you actually put the application. So we try to keep the shell to about 20% of the FPGA total, and then leaving 80% of the reconfigurable logic for an application. Um, and you know, the, there's a new technique, I mean, known and discussed for a long time, but really only now starting to work called partial reconfiguration, where you can program part of the FPGA without disturbing the rest of it. Uh, and this is, you know, this has been in development a long time and it's finally starting to work. And so what you can do is keep the shell up and operational and then you can push a new application into that core without disturbing the shell. So you can be routing network traffic, communicating over PCIe, and then you can be changing applications on the fly without completely reconfiguring the whole FPGA. And that turns out to be necessary to keep the whole system up in, in the cloud. So what we did is we, we uh, translated the Bing Ranker code from C++ to Verilog. Uh, it was about four person years to do that. And I'll show you a little bit of detail about how that works now. Uh, apologies to those of you who are well versed in search engine architectures. So if you look at the Bing flow and the other major search engines certainly have a similar flow, not exactly the same, but you know, at 10,000 feet, they all look similar. <coughs> Excuse me, you have a front end where, where web queries will come in and there's a front end cache there. And so if you hit in the cache, you just return those results. But you know, somewhere between a quarter and a, f a half the time you miss in that cache, and you actually need to then do go to the web index and rank the document and, or rank the query that's that's been presented. Okay, so so on a miss you go down to this thing called a TLA. Uh, this stands for top level aggregator, and like in a MapReduce program, this is the the server that's actually going to marshal and control and coordinate the whole query. Okay, so what the TLA does is it takes that query and it farms it out to a number of racks of machines. Let's say 40 racks of machines or 20 racks of machines, you know, how many depends on, uh, on the index and at any given time. And so there's a, something called a mid-level aggregator in each of those racks. So let's just say it's 20 racks. You have 20 mid-level aggregators, one in each rack, and it will accept the query. And then it will farm that query out to every server in the rack, in its rack. And these are called the IFMs or index file managers. They each have a chunk of the web index. Okay, so now, you know, if it's 48 machines and 20 racks, you're at, you know, just about a thousand servers. And so you're fanning out the query from the TLA through these MLAs to, to the thousand servers, which each have a chunk of the web index, and they're all going to rank the documents that they have on, on their index. And so the index file manager will do, so logically, and it's a little bit different physically, I'll show you that in a moment, runs through a three-stage pipeline. There's L0, which says, what are all of the documents that match this query, okay? So if I search for multi-core day, how many documents have both the term multi-core and the term day? And that can be thousands on just on one server. That's what the L0 does. Then the L1 filters that down. It says of these thousand documents on this server, let me take it down to the best four, you know, the most promising three or four or five documents. And that's what the L1 does. It's a fast filter. And then the L2, which is what we call ranking, will actually take those four documents and go through a computationally intensive process to give them each a score. Okay. And that score is where, determines where that document will come in the final search rankings. So this is where Google and Bing and DuckDuckGo uh, and Baidu and others really battle for web relevance. It's all how good are those scores and do they return things in the best order for you. Okay. So, so for those thousand documents, or across all the servers, it might be 20,000 documents that you rank, or 4,000, you know, they'll each have a score. All the scores in the documents flow back to the top level aggregator. It will then sort them, and that's the order in which you see the results come back. Okay, so now physically, the L0 and L1 is what we call selection. They take the query, and they boil that down to a very small number of documents. They select, say, four documents per server from the whole index, and that runs on one set of servers. Then there's ranking, which takes that small number of documents and assigns them a score. Okay, that's running on a different set of servers. So these are services now. And so selection will get the query in, will produce a set of documents, it'll send those documents over to ranking, 
which will pull the documents off of their solid state disks and compute the scores. And it's ranking that we actually ported to this FPGA fabric as a first example of how you might specialize workloads with logic in the cloud. Okay, so uh, in the interests of time, I will skip over this. And I, here I will just say that there are three, there are uh, six main stages in this ranking flow. The first ones just get the query, do some analysis, pull the document off the disk, and then find the positions of all the surf terms in the documents. And then once you have that, that's called a hit vector. And you give the hit vector to these last three stages here. One's called feature extraction, where you pull thousands of dynamic features out of the document that are used to drive the machine learning engine. I'll talk more about those in a moment. The second is freeform expressions, where you take those features and you compute some synthetic features by mashing them up. You know, take the natural log of feature seven and add two and divide by feature three. And that's a new synthetic feature. And then you take that big bucket of thousands of dynamic features and thousands of synthetic features, and you feed that to a machine learning algorithm, uh, which will produce the final score. And, and I, we don't disclose what machine learning algorithm it is, but as an example, if you were using neural nets, there might be thousands of neural networks in that one stage. They'd each produce a subscore, and then you'd add those all up, and you'd get a final score. Okay, so there are thousands of components in that machine learning scoring stage. And of course, you do all of this for every document you rank. So this is this is this flow you do for each document. Okay, so I just have a, a quick example here. So if I have the uh, Wikipedia text here for field programmable gate array, and let's say I do a search for query configuration, I'm sorry, FPGA configuration. So one example of a very simple feature, there are obviously much more complex ones, but a simple feature is number of occurrences of query term zero, which in this case is FPGA. How many times does it, it, it happen in the body text? And so in this case, you can see that there are seven instances of the term FPGA. So that feature would have a score of seven. And then uh, how many occurrences do we see of the term configuration, you know, query term one? Well, there are four of those. And how many times do I see a tuple of, of terms zero and one, Qu uh, FPGA and then configuration? And you can't see it I, very well, but there's a green box there that shows the only place that happens. So that has an example of one. So these are three values for features that you would extract from the document. But of course, there are thousands of different features specified that you extract from every document. Okay, and then for the second stage, freeform expressions, you will just have an arithmetic tree, which will compute a number based using some of those features as inputs. So take the two times number of occurrences zero, add the second value number of occurrences one, divide that by two times the number of tuples, uh, and then, of course, you get an answer, which is nine. And of course, these are actually floating point numbers, but I made them integer for, for uh, just for simplicity. And so now, of course, you do thousands of these. So we have thousands of these expression trees uh, that are able to that compute these synthetic features. Now, what you see here is there's a ton of fine-grained parallelism. You're computing thousands of features, you're running thousands of these expressions, and then you're running thousands of these machine-learned units. You could actually implement this on a many-core design. Okay, so another way to do this would be to take these ranking engines and implement them as, as many core. Okay, that's not what we did. We used the programmable logic. But there's a ton of parallelism here. It's very fine-grained, many small operations you can do. And so it's going to be an interesting debate what the right way to harvest the ex efficiency of this parallelism in the cloud is. So now when you actually look at what we built on the FPGAs, really they break into three main stages. <coughs> there's the feature extraction stage. I'll show you more on that in a minute. Then there's the freeform expression stage, which has, actually has a number of soft processor cores synthesized on the FPGA. And then there's the machine learning stage, which has a large number of machine learning units or accelerators uh, synthesized on that FPGA. So really, this is you can think of these, the first stage as regular expression processors or state machines. The second one is much more of a fine-grained multi-core design, although synthesized down onto an FPGA using the programmable logic. And then the third one is, is very, very domain-specific cores really dedicated to doing only one task. So that's a many, many core design, but, but they're, very, they're not general at all. They're very specialized for that units. So I'll talk about the first two. So the feature extraction accelerator, what it does is it brings the hit vector in, which shows the positions of all the query terms, and then it streams that vector, all those tuples showing the position of the terms in the document, over you know, these, these hundreds of state machines that compute the features. And so you can think of this as uh, multiple instruction single data, and that you have the document as the single data, but you have all of these different 
regular expressions or you know multiple instruction streams that you're computing. And so you broadcast in hardware that document across all these state machines and they compute all of those thousands of features in parallel. That's on one FPGA. And then on the second stage we have, you know, then we stream all those features to the, the freeform expression soft cores. They have little programs uh, that are written at basically almost as microcode and each program computes one of those expression trees. And so, you know, we, in, in the design we built, we have four simple cores, each with four threads, a complex unit to hold the, the natural log exponent, you know, floating to in and into float conversions. Um, and then that middle thing here is the feature storage tile. That's where the, the feature input features get stored. So this is a many core design, four threads per core, six cores per cluster, up to 10 clusters per chip. Um, and then, of course, you all compute these features in parallel. At the system level, the way this works is that we needed one, and this is at the time we published this work last, last summer, you need one FPGA to hold the feature extraction stage where you're computing all these features. You need three FPGAs to have enough state to hold all of the freeform expressions for the ranking models that Bing uses. And you need three FPGAs to hold all those machine learning scoring units. So you really need seven FPGAs total just to hold the whole model. And so what we do is we form these rings of eight FPGAs on that fabric. So we'll grab eight that are in a, you know, on one dimension in a ring. And that seventh one there is a spare. And I'll show you how we use the spares in a moment. And so now each, of course, FPGA has a server attached to it. It's a very FPGA-centric view of the system. And uh, a server might inject a document. You know, it'll compute the hit vector. We'll inject that onto its local FPGA. On the, the specialized hardware fabric network that we built, it'll route that document up to the head of the pipeline where it will queue that in its local DRAM until it's ready to be served. And then it will send that document down the pipeline computing the score and it will route the score back to the server. Okay, so from the server's perspective, all it knows is that it's supposed to compute the hit vector and then send that over to PCIe and then something in IO space computes the result and you know a few, like 100 microseconds later, that thing in IO space will actually DMA the result into its local memory and wake up the thread. Okay, so it's, it doesn't actually know what's happening on the hardware fabric. Of course, you want to design the system with the hardware and the software designers working together. Uh, but from the application point of view, it just calls out to IO space and gets the result. Yes, question? Does it know that there is a, a specialized hardware, or did you create any uh, interface so that yes. actually it is uh, it's a great question. service or function oriented interface? In so, so the question, if I don't uh, mangle it, was, you know, does the does the software know that the specialized hardware is out there, and how do we reason about that in the interface? And so we we had to come up with a a series of 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 uh, protocols, interfaces, and and, and APIs. That, that you can call, for instance, to detect if there's hardware there. You know, does the server have one of uh, an entrance into this fabric? And if it does, you can then call into the fabric. And if it doesn't, you then instead d jump to software and do the ranking in software. Okay. So from the from the server's point of view, from the software, it will call a request will come off. It'll compute the hit vector on the server in software, and then it will call a function called rank. And then underneath that function is a little glue logic that will do the test and vector it either to hardware or software. So the intent is for the higher level system, you know, application designer not to have to worry about it. You know, you want to abstract that function away. And then if you have a, if you're running on a server that doesn't have the hardware, you default to software. And of course, eventually you want all of the servers to have the hardware because you want it to be homogenous. Okay, thank you for the question. And of course, not just one server is doing this in parallel, but all of these servers, all eight of them in this case, are injecting documents, uh, you know, at full, at full rate onto this fabric and they're all getting routed up in parallel and served and scored and routed back. So there's a huge amount of, of routing and parallelism going on here on the fabric to maintain this. And of course, in a large scale deployment, you have to worry about failures. And fortunately, the Bing stack, as the other search engines, have, has been architected to be resilient to failures. So if a server is unresponsive, the top level aggregator, that query master, Will will detect that that server hasn't responded. It will time out, and it will revector the request to request to a different server that has the same copy of the index. Okay, so we're resilient to failures at the system level, but now at the local level, you have to figure out what happens when a when an FPGA or a server fails. 
You know, what happens if it reboots? Okay, all of a sudden that FPGA has disappeared from the fabric. And so we have, we, we built these services that will monitor the fabric and monitor the servers. And when they detect that something is unresponsive, they will take action. You know, the first thing they'll do is try reconfiguring the FPGA. If that doesn't work, then they'll just mark that node as failed. And then what the service will do is it will come in and it will actually rotate the ring by reconfiguring all the FPGAs to, to, to shift the functions so that the failed machine lines up with the spare. Okay? Now you have a contiguous ring and you don't talk to the, the spare, so you're okay. If another machine fails, then you have two failures in the ring, you can't support that, and then you, you uh, route query to other rings on the fabric. Okay, so that's how we, that's how we had handed single failure simply, and then of course, more complex things happen when you have more failures. And there are a lot of other things we do uh, that, we, that we talk about in our paper to get, to get this all right. You know, we have to scrub for soft errors, uh, you know, we have health checks, we have to do wiring checks, and, and you know, there's a bunch of work we had to do in the drivers. So there were a lot of little details we had to get right for this all to stay up. Okay, so but at cloud scale, you, you never know if these things will work until you actually run them at scale. And so the, the Bing leadership was, uh, was kind enough to, to fund a, a pilot. And so we manufactured about 1,800 of these boards, and we deployed 1,632 of them in new servers in our Virginia data center in the United States. Uh, and we actually brought up the entire Bing stack on that, on that deployment. We didn't serve live customer traffic. We actually would mirror the traffic off. And so we'd have, you know, when, it, when queries would come in, we'd send them to the real servers, and then we'd also route them to our, our pilot deployment. Uh, but this was large enough scale to actually run the ranking service and the selection services on this bed. So we were able to see how well it worked, how well did it stay up, did it crash, you know, did it give you bad results, and all that. And so the, the good news was that it actually worked really well. So it was very reliable. The FPG for boards didn't fail any more frequently than the other hardware components. Uh, we, the software stack, the shell, and the drivers were stable enough that we didn't lock up very often. And you know, rebooting usually helped that. That was very rare. And then what we, what we saw in terms of results, so on the, uh, on the y-axis here, I have the throughput rate of web queries. So you can think about this queries per second. So higher is a, a higher throughput rate. And on the x-axis, I show latency. And all these numbers are normalized because the Bing people didn't want us to publish absolute numbers. So, um, so of course, as you, as you go up on the y-axis, as you turn up the throughput, your latencies start to increase. And of course, because this is a real-time service, you have, you have a bunch of, of SLAs or service level agreements that says, you know, my average query will only be so slow. My 95th percent slowest query will be this latency or, or better. My 99th percent slowest query will be this latency or better. And so you have, a, you have a distribution that you need to meet. And they work very, very hard to meet that distribution. And if you, you can't meet it, well, then you need to back off on the aggressiveness of your ranking algorithm so you free up some CPU so that they get less loaded and they can run faster. Or you turn down the query load by buying more machines. And so the, the blue line shows the throughput latency trade-off curve for when we ran ranking in software. The red line shows what happens when what happened when we put in the hardware fabric. Now it turns out that with the, those three stages that I showed you, we only we only offloaded about half of the actual code. You know, we can still move the hit vector code over. Eventually, we're hoping to access the SSDs directly from the FPGAs. But for this pilot, we only did about half of the code. So we got what you would expect with Amdahl's law. You know, a two x throughput increase. If you're offloading half the work and you're making it really fast. You're likely to see a two x gain. And so at this, at this latency point here where you see the vertical line, that's w that was actually Bing's latency target for the 95th percent slowest query, which is the graph I'm showing here. And what you can see is that we could actually run double the throughput uh, at the same latency. Okay. And what that means, of course, is that you can run with half as many servers to service a given query load. So adding this FPGA card into every server at you know, a 10% power bump allowed us to buy half as many servers to run this service. So it's actually a huge amount of monetary savings because these servers are expensive. And of course, once we deployed the fabric and got everything working, we didn't see any hardware failures of the boards, and this ran for about a month. Okay, I think I've talked about most of these um, most of these things. I will say that, that to run the service, we needed about 1,200 servers out of the 1,600, and we ran that for about a month, you know, turning the load up, turning the load down, rebooting machines, uh, installing patches, you know, sending in new queries, new copies of the index, reboot, you know, 
and, and really they, they beat it up pretty hard to make sure that it would stay up and stay stable. And so what, what uh, I'm happy to say is that, is that they not only let us publish the work after the pilot was over, but the results were good enough that they decided to go to live production. Okay, so the next generation of, that, of the boards, which we haven't disclosed, we haven't disclosed the architecture for the second generation yet, but that's being manufactured now, and we'll be actually going to full production in early 2015. And so you'll be able to go and do Bing searches, and those searches will actually go and be being ranked on the FPGA fabric. Um, now that will be in a first data center, and they're planning to move hopefully to more data centers uh, after that. So I'm hoping we can get a little hardware address so you can be guaranteed that it will run on the ranking, because that's of course the one I'll use when I do searches. Okay, um, and so, I mean, I think what we, what we showed with this fabric is that we're able to exploit very fine-grained parallelism by doing synthesizable multi-core designs that are specialized to the workloads, especially those last two parts of the stage that I showed you. Uh, the technology seems to be resilient enough to put into production at scale. The monetary savings are very high. And now, of course, the challenge is, you know, Bing is still only a small percentage of our servers. So if we really want this to happen, we need to show the economic argument across many more of Microsoft services so that we go across all of the servers because you're, not, you're unlikely just going to go to a deployment in Bing. This next thing is sort of a live test at the next level of scale up. Um, so it will be serving production traffic, but it won't be everywhere. And because of the homogeneity, requi homogeneity requirement, if you want a specialization fabric like, fabric like this to really work, it has to support all of the services or enough that it's economically viable to put them in all the servers. Yes, question? Just wondering if you also handle the upload of a new uh, FPGA version or FPGA program in runtime and how you do it. Yes, that's a great question. So the question is how do we handle upload of new FPGA images? And so Bing has actually hired hardware designers and they are now maintaining that stack for production. And so when new, you know, they roll out a new model every month, we actually, on that, for that architecture that I showed, you can think of the instructions for those specialized units as a intermediate representation. And so when they, you know, when they, u Bing uses very aggressive machine learning to train these models automatically, you know, one for each language, and they might have many experimental models in flight at any, any time to evaluate, you know, is this a better, you know, Swedish model, is this a better English model, and so on and so forth. And so, um, when we, when we get a new model, there's a model file that describes it. We run that through a model compiler and it generates all of the microcode for the FPGA images. And so we just roll out those binary files to support new models. If they roll out a model which requires a change to our engines, like maybe some new instruction in the freeform, some new operator, then we actually have to update the Verilog. And then we have you know, a, a large scale automated data center management service that can, we, 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 we rebuild the, the bitstream images for the FPGAs, and then we hand those bitstreams to that service, and it will roll them out to all the servers. And then when you, know, when you, when you boot the server, you'll just you know, replace it. And so there's actually an automated flow. You know, when you want, say, I want service X, there's a way to update those services, but there's also a way for the server to say, okay, I need to be service X, so I'm gonna pull this file off of disk and send it with a reconfiguration command across a USB to JTAG interface and, and re reconfigure the FPGA. So all of that is built and stable and running at scale. We had to do all of that to get it to work reliably. Okay, that's, that's, that's my talk. So I'd, I'd be happy to take some more questions, but thank you very much for your attention. Yep. Okay, and there was a Question back here, but we're going to start here. Uh, so, um, so how programmer friendly is this? So we saw the quote earlier this morning. Who ordered that? Well, we know who ordered this, but um, so what were the programmers' reaction when you introduced them to this? Um, well, the early reaction of the software developers and the executives was, "You're going to do what? <laughs> right? To to my, to my search engine? How many people do we have that can program this? Zero. Okay. Ha ha. Go away. Go back to research and play." Uh, actually, they were, they were very supportive, but they, they were initially fairly skeptical for good reason. And I'll, I'll say two things to answer your programming question. The first is that there's no panacea, obviously. Um, as you build these soft core or these parallel implementations, you can, you can greatly reduce the need to program at that level in Verilog because you have these engines that you can now compile down to. 
Okay, so that was one thing. You know, we're not changing the Verilog every time we want to run a new model. So that abstraction saves you some work. Actually, it saves you a lot. Uh, the second thing I'll say is that if you look at any of these search engines, these are large-scale, highly valuable services, you know, serving millions or hundreds of tens or hundreds of millions of customers, and they have a la large, large number, thousands of software engineers, you know, tweaking it, improving it, growing the index, you know, finding domains to, to improve all of these things. So the, you know, if you have that many engineers hiring a small hardware team, you know, two, five, 10, 20 people is actually a relatively small investment for the economic gains you get. So you could imagine for any of these large services, it's actually not inconceivable, you know, to hire a, a 10 person team to maintain the back end engine. The third thing is that the uh, C to Gates flows, OpenCL in particular, um, Xilinx has a Vivado tool that does just C to Gates. Both Xilinx and Altera have these OpenCL compilers that take OpenCL programs and synthesize them in, or transmit them, transmute them into Verilog. Those seem to be getting better and better and they actually seem to be starting to work well. Okay, so I think you know, for us there's no s magic bullet. It's a question of architecting things so you don't need to change the Verilog too often hiring Verilog teams to maintain it, using those higher level languages when you can and when it generates sufficiently good code. And our strategy going forward will be a mix of those three. Yep. Question down here, or we had one up there. Sorry, I'm sure the mic will get over there soon. Thanks, it, it was really good. Um, oh, thank you. I think you made a very good argument for FPGAs, I suppose, but you've already brought up my point, which is why don't you just use a more software friendly standard layer like OpenCL, which would, allow you to put other kind of devices there? Or why not have an ASIC that's a query engine? Because it's, there's quite a lot of cost to designing FPGA um, Verilog, yes. and it's, there's quite yes. a lot of cost um, in integrating that into a system, mm -hmm. and virtualizing it. And yeah, I can see how it works one big service like Bing, where you can spread it out amongst thousands of servers, but then right. does it really work for your other systems? Would it not be better to virtualize it at a software level? Okay, so it's a great question. Uh, it's a, probably a long discussion to be had over beer, <laughs> but I don't have a beer, we don't have that much time, so I'll give you a short answer. The, the, the question about ASICs is I already, I think, talked about why we wouldn't do ASICs for search um, because of the need for homogeneity. Bing does not want specialized ASICs in its servers and an example I used last night at dinner, for example, was you know recently Apple announced with iOS 8 that uh, Spotlight, their desktop search, would be using Bing as its backend for for incorporating web results into that search, just the same way that our Windows you know now search now goes to the web and to your local machine. Okay, how many servers should we provision for going forward for that Spotlight service for Bing? The answer is we have no idea. I mean, how many people will be using that desktop search? What will be the rate of adoption of iOS 8? Turns out they had, some, they had some stability problems and some bugs, so it's actually been slower than expected. So we really don't want to have a fixed set of Bing servers that only have that ASIC in them in case it grows faster than we expect. Um, so that homogeneity is really important. So we really don't want a Bing ASIC. Now long term, if things get really stable and it's larger, sure, we, we might do it. But for now, the, the ASIC approach doesn't seem to make sense. In terms of why don't we do OpenCL and then be able to target many things, uh, when I started this project, uh, in, in 2010, I wanted to build something that I thought could get over the hump. The tools at that time weren't mature enough to do that. And so we just sort of rolled up our sleeves, took the 30,000 lines of C++ that was Bing's back end, and translated it into Verilog. That was sort of the, the, the price we paid to play. Okay, now the tools are getting better. We have a deployment. We're gonna start, you, we're gonna continue to evaluate them. We might start using code. Over time, if they work really well, we might move a big part of our base over to OpenCL. And then you might have the choice of using many different accelerators. You know, for each generation, you could pick the one you wanted. We don't know what's gonna happen. And this might not be the right architecture. This might be not be the right strategy. It seems to be working. So we're gonna run with it pretty hard and see where we go. I don't know what the right answer is long-term. I mean, I hope this is it, but I'm sure it will evolve also. You know, so we, there's, there's, you know, we're charging off into the mist and this is new and we don't really know what's gonna happen. And there's a question here in the back who's been, he's been very patient. <laughs> yeah, good talk. Uh, the Thank um, you. The FBA, FPGAs comes in very many different sizes and forms, right? From yes. $10 parts to $10,000 parts. For this dual plane compute model that you showed, have you researched anything about where 
it makes sense to use that compute model. Sort of what what level of how much logic do you actually need to have in an FPGA for that compute model to, to give gains? Great question. Um, so yes, we have looked at it very carefully, as you might imagine. Uh, in the paper, we actually disclosed that we were using Altera Stratix 5 D5 parts. So it's the high-end line, and it's a part that's about the midpoint of the high-end line. So if you look at the high-end price curve and capability curve, it's, it's sort of on the knee of the curve. So we wanted to get as much logic as we could get without paying those crazy price premiums when you go to the super high end. Um, the answer is, you know, we always want more. So whenever you put something like this and give a lot of performance potential, you just eat it up really quickly and then you're starving for more. I need more gates, I want more gates, okay? But the economics have to work and this has to be proven at scale. So I don't think, because this is fairly new, internally we don't know what the dollar value of each logic element is. You know, how valuable are the services we're going to roll out on it? How much money will we eventually save? Once we know that, you know, when, if, if we get more services running well and we save a bunch of money and we're able to scale up, then we'll have an economic model that says this is the value of a gate and we'll actually be able to pick the optimal point. And my guess is we'll probably go a little bit bigger. Um, but right now, you know, before you've proven it, you're pretty constrained by cost. So we, we stayed with that part that we disclosed. I'm very excited about Intel's 14 nanometer Stratix 10 parts, by the way, because then we're going to get a big, a big bump, even though the cost per transistor is not dropping as fast as it used to. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.